Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 14th lecture of the MOOC course on Sociological Perspectives on Modernity. In the last lecture, in the last couple of lectures, we have discussed the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the lens of holism or totality. When I say holism or totality in the case of structuralist interpretation of modernity, I mean ultra relationalist case, uh, within that we have discussed uh, relationalism and the death of the subject or death of the author. We have also discussed difference, functionalism and, and modernity. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the lenses of three other three other important central philosophical and political foundations of critical modernist paradigm in sociology namely uh, social movements rationality and and reflexivity okay okay now let us start with social movements through the works of levi strauss and althusser within social movements we are going to discuss ideology and function and and what are the political backgrounds i mean what kind of two marxisms which have uh, emerged okay and within nationality we are going to discuss the meaning of science okay how science can be uh, construed uh, or how science has been construed uh, in structuralism and and in reflexivity we are going to discuss levi strauss's uncertainty principle. Now, let us start with ideology and uh, function within social movements through the works of Levi Strauss and, and Louis Althusser. As with social change, okay, so with social movements, structuralism has remarkably little to contribute. Let me put it this way, because if you say complementarity and, 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 and uh, uh, reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor okay. <coughs> and the kind of functional explanations or teleological explanations which we have discussed in the last lecture that that no uh, we are not going to I mean the, the way structuralists argued that uh, no uh, there is no cause and effect relationship uh, with the kind of social change that we witness um, over a period of time and across space. Okay. Practically, structuralism has, has little to contribute to, to the idea of social movements or to the idea of social change, because, because structuralists believe in the continuity of, of any kind of social, economic, political, cultural, institutional, ideological, legal, or ethical order. If I mean, I mean, this 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 derives partly from from the relationalism and and the death of the subject or death of the author that we have already discussed. I mean, if if human agency uh, is simply an illusion. I mean, if the individual, if human agency ceases to exist. Okay. what we have only relational, okay. then social movements can be explained either in terms of a functional contribution to social change, particularly in the, in the case of the workers movements or more commonly as an ideological reaction against social change. And in this context, particularly in the case of the new social movement. 
what is this uh, uh, workers movements I said and then uh, new social movements. Okay. I mean <coughs> when I say workers movements, workers I mean conventionally speaking workers movements were based on only classes in, in, in a strict Marxian term, Marxist term that classes are manifestations of economic differentiation, uh, classes are constituted not on the basis of the income that one earns, but, but on, on the basis of the position that one occupies in the process of production or the functions that one performs in the process of production. For example, there are two blacksmiths, one an owner of the own farm and the other a paid worker, then both belong to two different classes, not one. Okay. Okay. In, this, in this strict Marxist sense, when I say workers movements, okay. I mean Marx was not the first to discover social classes or their plights, but he came to the center stage when he said the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, uh, the point however is to change it. The societies uh, Marx has analyzed have traversed through different stages namely hunting and gathering economy, uh, and the slave society, the feudal society and the capitalist society which will uh, unstoppably move on to socialism and thereafter communism. And of these, of these various stages of society as Marx uh, outlined, the first I mean hunting and gathering economy uh, and, and socialism and communism are classless societies whereas whereas uh, uh, slavery, feudalism and capitalism are class society. Okay. In this sense, I am talking about workers movements and, and the, uh, then if there are, uh, if slavery, feudalism and, and capitalism are class societies, okay. in this sense, uh, then what are the classes? In slavery, we, we, we had um, slave lords as well as slaves. In feudalism, we had feudal lords as well as serfs. In capitalism, we have capitalists and working class. If I if I put a um, um, if what what Marx the way Marx put us common common uh, Marx put uh, uh, common terms to both classes, all these classes I mean slave lords, feudal lords, or capitalists they are considered bourgeois, whereas slaves, serfs and working classes, they, they, uh, they are termed as the proletariat, bourgeois, haves, own, owning classes and so on uh, or, ex, or exploiting classes and so on. And when I say proletariat, I mean have not um, owned classes, exploited classes and so on. <coughs> okay. I mean when I uh, when I refer to workers movements, I look at workers movements are based on Marx's notion of classes. Okay. But when I say uh, new social movements, new social movements have been able to, to not simply take classes as a, as a, as a uh, classes I mean industrial working class. As, a, as, a, as an important variable for, for new social, for the proponents of new social movements, it is very important to look at not simply the new industrial working classes, okay, but also gender, caste, uh, race, okay, um, uh, religious minorities okay, the, uh, or, or, uh, uh, or immigrants. I mean, there, there, are, there are many, many <coughs> categories, environment, women's movements uh, and I mean environment, environmental and ecological movements and so on. Okay. These, I mean, when I, our agrarian movements, peasants movements and so on. The, the, the main distinction between workers movements and new social movements is that workers movements only look at classes uh, on the basis of which workers movements can take place and new social movements try to include many more categories 
namely race, caste, gender, uh, environment and uh, agriculture, peasantry and so on in that in its category. Okay. In this sense, in this sense structuralism has little to contribute. Structuralism uh, does not uh, I mean has never or has not yet been able to make a framework of, of such social movements or, or, or theories of social change or any foundation to carry out social and political struggles, okay, whether it was on the basis of class or any other variable namely caste, race, gender, uh, environment, uh, agriculture and so on. That is that is why the, 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 the in the context of ideology and function the purpose of this exercise is to, to examine structuralist interpretation of social movements okay, as a contribution to to critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay. Now, let us see the political background the two Marx agents. Okay. What are these two Marx agents? What uh, the kind of Marx uh, I mean the, what Marx said was not an ism in itself, okay. but what actually Marx said became an ism in uh, under the uh, political climate of certain countries. Okay. Okay. I mean such such weakness derives partly from the interaction of theory with social movements themselves. A, a good example here is Althusser. Althusser was a member of the communist party of France, which was perhaps the most immobile of the major communist parties of western Europe and an organization which could perhaps be described less as the political wing of the workers movement than as the congealed wing of the workers movement. Frame, uh, I mean French workers throughout the 20th century participated in a number of extremely radical actions, general strikes, mass occupations of factories, the French resistance and so on. At the same time, the communists were by far the most important working class party and indeed controlled the main trade union federation and the greater part of the French resistance. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the communist party of France was not just a particularly orthodox and dogmatic one. By contrast, the communist party of Italy for example, it was also committed to the view for most of its history that radical change was simply not on the cards in France partly for reasons of economic organization, but particularly because of the post second world war situation there. Uh, I mean where on the one hand it saw that a takeover of power would be likely to be crushed militarily by the western allies and where on the other hand de Gaulle's semi independent foreign policy which led to the French armed forces for example, not being under the NATO control was felt to be the best that could be hoped for. Uh, the, the, the net result was that in 1944-45, instead of turning the predominantly communist resistance into an attempt at taking power as had happened in countries like Yugoslavia, the party accepted the political realities reflected by the western allies support for T. Okay. Similarly, in 1968, the communist dominated general labor federation was instrumental in keeping the general strike under control, especially it started in France in fact, by students community physically excluding student radicals from the factories where they might have undermined the party's position and, and de-radicalizing the demands of the strike. In France in particular in, in 1968 was almost as such as much a rebellion of the libertarian left against the communist party of France as it was a challenge to the state. It is therefore, not very surprising to find a party philosopher keen to exclude any possibility that human agency could actually make a significant difference. Then when I said two Marxisms, okay, 
the case of two Marx agents. Okay. Uh, more generally, Althusser's structuralist Marxism can be seen as the logical development of one stand. But let me tell you, but when I say one stand, but that is the only stand. Stand of what? Stand of Marxist thinking. Okay. The other approach, Western Marxism, is more closely associated with social movements and activist parties. The kind of static Marxism, I mean unchanging Marxism practiced by Althusser is associated with parties who are either in power or who for other reasons are keen to minimize the possibility of large scale social action which is not entirely under their control. Okay. What kind of two Marxisms? One kind of Marxism that is static Marxism which was practiced by Althusser and, and the other Marxism uh, was particularly by I mean I mean I, if I have to say changing Marxism I mean dynamic Marxism okay, was was practiced by uh, even even today it is it is mostly practiced by the People's Republic of China. Okay. It does not it does not believe in uh, static Marxism it believes in dynamic Marxism okay. that these are the two Marxisms that we find find in the context of uh, social movements uh, and, and, and Althusser deviated from, from um, some kind of I mean I mean uh, so, I mean that uh, I mean deviated from uh, the, the changing Marxist standpoint uh, perspective and so on. Anyway, Western Marxism I am not going to discuss right now. We are going to discuss in we will start with this uh, with, with this philosophical train uh, theoretical trajectory of Western Marxism when we will be discussing uh, uh, the works of Lukacs, Gramsci and Turenne. Okay. In the next lecture we are going to discuss this. Then at least till now I hope you are aware of, of the, 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 the philosophical engagement of structuralism with modernity in, in the case of uh, or through the lenses of holism or totality on the one hand and, and social movements on the other. Okay. Now, let us see how structuralism through the works of Levi Strauss and Althusser has contributed to, to the debates on, uh, on critical modernist paradigm in sociology through, through the lenses of rationality uh, uh, and reflexivity. Let us first start with rationality. When I say rationality, uh, I mean I always uh, refer to um, uh, reasoning capacity, I mean uh, Cartesian philosophy of science uh, where René Descartes said uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, I doubt therefore I am, I interrogate therefore I am, I question therefore I am. I mean my entire existence is contingent upon the way I think, the way I question, the way I interrogate the way I doubt. There is a there is a transition from the world of certainty okay, to a world of doubt. Okay. There is a transition from the culture of conformity to, to the culture of uh, to a culture of deviance and, and, and structuralism is also of interest of its notion of rationality or as it is more usually phrased its claim to scientific status, sometimes this represents a pure positivistic approach in terms of its research methods. I mean the social facts are assumed to be out there to be amenable to pure observation uh, and analyzed on the model of natural science. This kind of thing happens to any theory and it is not a fault peculiar to a structuralist practice. What is rather more interesting uh, is the structuralist version of science represented in much structuralist thought. Okay. You know positivism, I mean supremacy of sciences over na natural sciences over non-sciences and so on. Uh, positivists uh, always believe in uh, an unilinear uh, relationship between observation and theory, I mean observations. Uh, um, 
lead to theory generation. Theories are observation dependent, whereas observations are theory independent. Okay. You know this, I mean the positivists, uh, I mean the scientific stage which suggests that no, there must be a dichotomy between fact and value. I mean all met methodological monism, uh, inductivism, I mean the method of science is method the method of induction and so on. Okay. All systematic verifiability and so on, we have already discussed this, this uh, in the initial lectures. What we normally assume when we hear the word science in English that it refers to the natural sciences or to methods which are based on those of the natural sciences. What generally lies behind this is what we can loosely call an empiricist model of science. That is a method of method the method of science is the method of induction when I say inductivism is based on empiricism, empiricism is based on experience. That is why I said uh, what generally lies behind this such such argument that that um, science refers to the natural sciences or to methods which are based on those of the natural sciences. What generally lies behind such such conceptualization is that is, is what we can loosely call an empiricist model of science. Science is uh, taking its starting point from what is believed to be empirical reality or experience which literally means the reality available to us uh, available to the senses. We can observe and experience with this reality and, and attempt to build up valid generalizations about its behavior. Okay. Um, in, in sociology, this is what is normally meant by arguments about sociology as a science. What is commonly argued against it is that the reality we experience is already structured by ideas such as the idea of time and that social reality is, is already mediated by the forms of social interaction such as language. Okay. In, in each case it is said we cannot have a pure or unproblematic knowledge of reality. In this case we cannot have a pure observation. We, 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 I repeat in each case it is said we cannot have a pure or unproblematic knowledge of reality. And this empiricist model of science can nevertheless be contrasted with a rationalist model of science, uh, which argues that our knowledge of the world is at least initially a mental one rather than a real one. The implication of being uh, that in one way or another, we can know reality through thought alone. This program takes an enormous variety of forms, but two elements are fairly constant. The first is that at the end of the day, the most important thing is to think systematically and consistently. The first is that at the end of the day, the most important thing is to think systematically and consistently. That is why we all, I mean, I mean in research methods, we always say that no one must deploy both empiricist as well as um, rationalist methods of science, okay? systematically and consistently. Thus, the second is that in general, we will tend to look for a hidden reality underlying and explaining the, the observable world. Okay? We are not going to look at unobservable world. Okay? In explanation, these two emphases tend to take precedence over what we might call faithfulness to the world as observed or experienced. Okay. The latter, I mean the second one is pressed into consistency or the elements which do not fit are discarded. That is why we always say that no, we, one must make consistent explanation. It is summarily explained in terms of what are claimed to be the real underlying truths of the situation. Many authors Many thinkers in practice combine elements of both these approaches, both empiricism as well as rationalism. I mean, in other words, both inductivism as well as, as, well as hypothesism. Okay. Uh, but and, 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 and it may be difficult not to uh, uh, 
a fairly common sense understanding of social theory after all would say that it aims both at internal consistency and at being an adequate account or explanation of the observed world. But if we if if the two of these are pulling in different directions, if we claim as does Levi Strauss uh, that the real world is unobservable, only the idea, okay, because it is unconscious, for example, then we will have to come down on one side or the other. Structuralism's claim to be scientific generally comes down on the side of rationalism, in other words, of aiming at being systematic and aiming to uncover a hidden reality. Okay? This is very important. And this sense of the word science is rather more widespread in continental lang uh, languages, which are capable of describing literary criticism, theology and so on as sciences. What is meant is not that they represent an equivalent to physics or chemistry, but that they are systematic in approach. If we add that the, the, the reality which is hidden that is aimed at or discovered is, is likely to be a mental one, given that the rationalist is explicitly taking their own thought as the starting point or indeed the totality of all that is known, we can see the fit between, fit between this model of scientific rationalism and structuralism as a systematic ordering of mental categories. Okay. But actually that is not, I mean Althusser's scientific rationalism is in some way even more thorough going than Levi Strauss. While he claims, I mean while Althusser claims that there is a real world out there to which theory in some sense corresponds, scientific method has absolutely no need of empirical verification. Okay. I mean um, for example, um, Martin J summarizes Althusser's conception of science very well. Let me uh, read it out, the, uh, read out, uh, read it out, I mean this is a quote okay, uh, that science Althusser claimed operates on the level of conceptual production in which experimental verification plays no role. It is nonetheless materialist because it posits an ultimate congruence between thought objects and a real world. The raw material for scientific activity is provided by ideological conceptions of the world, the facts that positivists innocently take as the givens of existence. In other words, scientific activity consists of the progressive refining, rethinking and systematizing of everyday knowledge of the world, I mean maybe ideological and political knowledge of the world. In Althusser's own practice, this takes the form of a scholastic proje scholastic project in which an ever decreasing selection of Marx's work is examined and rethought in order to produce what is presumably an ever purer uh, form of scientific knowledge. Okay. This is this is very important okay. in, in the context of science. Okay. And the way both Levi Strauss and particularly Louis Althusser tried to uh, bring about uh, a different uh, meaning of science, different relation of science, uh, I mean different uh, notion of science, uh, I mean where we, we find that, that, uh, that, uh, that science is situated, uh, our, our science posits Okay. Uh, an ultimate congruence, congruence between uh, thought objects and a real world. Okay. It mediates between, between, uh, between thought objects and the world of reality. And, and, and if thought object and I, I mean uh, if, if science can mediate between thought objects and a real world, okay. this, this contributes immensely uh, to, to our uh, critical engagement with, with modernity. Okay? Because science is not simply about, about ideas or, or, or reality, but science is able to mediate um, uh, between ideas and, and social, political, economic realities. Okay? Okay? 
that is what Martin J in Marxism and totality uh, uh, referred to. Now, now, now let us see how Levi Strauss okay, contributes to the domain of critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the lens of reflexivity. Okay. This is very important. Okay. Levi Strauss says uncertainty principle that is why uh, we generally uh, uh, refer to. Okay. This is very important. Levi Strauss I mean, I mean, um, when I say Levi Strauss's uncertainty principle, I mean, the last point that I want to mention in this lecture is perhaps a minor one, but it is unusual and perhaps worth bearing in mind. Levi Strauss, what is that? I mean, Levi Strauss, like many subsequent authors, argues for a close analogy between culture and language, as we have already noticed, okay? linguistic analogy. Mm. I mean, uh, quickly, quickly, I'll refer to how how uh, Levi Strauss uh, tried to um, bring about uh, bring about an analogy between culture and knowledge, uh, culture and language. Uh, if you if you uh, slightly recall in earlier lectures, in the context of holism or totality, um, in the context of difference, okay, uh, the way we discussed. Um, uh, how Le essentially Levi Strauss performs two operations in his account of human culture. On the one hand, uh, Levi Strauss uh, employs uh, a linguistic analogy to treat culture, okay? not just as a system of relations, but as a system of symbolic relations such as myths. And, and, on, on, and secondly, uh, using the same linguistic analogy, Levi Strauss aims at a purely formal description of the various elements involved in particular myths. In other words, Levi Strauss sets out to describe structure, but not content. Okay? Therein lies, lies a close analogy between uh, culture and language. That is why I, uh, we have discussed how, how what this leads to is an argument there is an objective meaning in human culture which is revealed by structure which is other than the subjective meaning revealed by content. Since nevertheless uh, this, this objective meaning cannot be straightforwardly shown to be present in a particular myth uh, once we bracket any question of the way people say um, they understand it or the contexts that they uh, um, uh, tell it in it has to be located within the unconscious. In other words, from a description of social relations, we move to a description of the nature of the human psyche. Uh, what, what Levi Strauss claims to be uh, the central feature of the human uh, unconscious, a claim which he believes to be backed up by, by linguistics, okay, is naturally enough identical with the concept he uses to analyze the objective meaning in, of the form of the myths, this concept is that of difference or, or distinction. Okay. For Levi Strauss, then the end of the intellectual journey is a description of the social um, and in particular cultural world uh, as a reflection of the supposed tendency of the human brain to divide things up. Okay. We, have, we have discussed this. Now, we are, we are, we are I, I, I mean, I, I try to go back a little to, to, to foreground the problematic of the analogy between culture and language. Okay. Obviously, this can imply virtually anything. If I have to, uh, uh, to discuss Levi Strauss's uh, argument for a close analogy between culture and language, okay. it, it, it may uh, mean uh, virtually anything depending on what we understand the nature of language to be. And Simon Clark has argued that Levi Strauss's concept of language does not does not correspond closely with how linguists either then or now thought about it. One element of Levi Strauss's uh, linguistic analogy is the argument that we can distinguish between the form and the content of a culture or of a language just as a language according to uh, Levi Strauss exists as a 
number of elements related in particular ways or forms I mean the form the form okay, which we can use to express particular meanings I mean the the the, the content. So, culture is fundamentally a form within which different contents can be expressed. In other words, while myths for example, may express a particular meaning to the people who actually tell them or hear them, this meaning is expressed within and determined by the broader form of myths structured around difference or distinction. What Levi Strauss deduces from this is a form of uncertainty principle. Whereas, in physics we may be in a position where we can measure light as a particle or as a wave, but not as both simultaneously in, in anthropology. Uh, I mean I mean if I have to say this I mean I have to put it this way whereas, in whereas in physics we may be in a position where we can measure light as a particle or as a wave, but not as both simultaneously in anthropology or sociology for Levi Strauss. Uh, we can know the content of a culture or its form, but uh, not both at the same time. In, in other words, we can think about the way a culture is structured and indeed about the way culture as a whole is structured. This is like thinking about the syntactical structure of a language okay? and like thinking about the syntax of a language, it cannot be done at the same time as thinking about the content or meaning. This implies that we can study the structure of a culture with one method or we can study the actual cultural meanings which are expressed with another method, but we cannot study both at the same time because a study of actual meanings presupposes a knowledge of the structure with which those meanings are expressed. We can think about current meanings within our culture, we can stand back and think about our culture as a whole. We can even think about a foreign culture, okay? uh, but we cannot think about the meanings expressed within a foreign culture for, for Levi Strauss uncertainty principle, okay? because we lack the necessary knowledge of its structure. Of course, obviously there are a number of problems with this claim, which I will not disentangle for you, uh, but it is worth thinking about as an unusual approach to the problem of reflexivity. Okay? This is important uh, uh, to understand. Then, 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 if I have to, uh, if we have to just recapitulate the this entire module of of ultra modernism, ultra relationalism, the structuralist case or the structuralist interpretation, okay, through the works of Levi Strauss uh, and and Louis Althusser, we must uh, uh, what we have then discussed, we will we'll see, okay, we have. We, we started this module like uh, I mean how structuralism claims to be considered a form to critical modernism is a more tenuous one, okay? while much structuralism claims to be Marxist very often it appears rather more as an incorporation of Marxism into a, a rather more affirmative mode of modernism. Okay. This is particularly evident in the difficulties structuralist thought faces in coming to terms with reflexivity as well as its consequent explicit or implicit flirtation with positivism. And Levi Strauss and Louis Althusser, uh, uh, they, they are uh, the main proponents or they, they contributed immensely to the to uh, uh, or, or rather put it putting it differently that um, we tried to examine the contributions of uh, uh, structuralism through the uh, to, to, to the debates on um, critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the works of uh, Levi Strauss and Louis Althusser. Okay? We have discussed the differences between Levi Strauss and Althusser, I mean they can uh, uh, certainly be said to be uh, critical in terms of their political positions. And, and the implications of some of their work, if not always in terms of reflexivity and, and there is a close intersectionality between structuralism, positivism and functionalism um, uh, uh, deriving from Comte and 
Durkheim which leads to Parsonian structural function. Okay. When we uh, and and then we discussed uh, uh, the works of uh, Levi Strauss and Louis Althusser uh, and their contributions to uh, critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the lenses of holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality, and social movements. In holism or totality, we have discussed relationalism. Uh, and the death of the subject or the death of the author and there we have discussed uh, uh, how in structuralism uh, relationship takes off and becomes fully independent it is no longer human beings who relate with each other but the fact of relationship which first creates the social and cultural individual out of an uh, amorphous biological mass we can only know the social in other words the relational and that the individual or human nature uh, are therefore, metaphysical concepts in the structuralist case in the strict sense that we cannot know them. Okay. And then we have also discussed how uh, Althusser argues that the category of the subject is the constitutive category of all ideology and our, 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 our um, illusory subjectivity generates ideology and ideology reproduces our illusions of subjectivity. Then in difference what we have discussed I mean all that we can know or all that exists is the relational. Okay. If all that we can know about is relations then we can think about the way in which those relations interact with one another in a very detached and often very formalistic approach. We can also try and categorize the different types of relation which are possible uh, and also levels of relation we will see I mean what relationalism is likely to lead us to in other words is a categorization of different types of relation and different levels of relation and an account of society in terms of the interrelation of these different relations. So, relational approaches tend towards this kind of categorization, but they also tend to privilege intellectual consistency over empirical usefulness. Okay. We have discussed this. Okay. Then, then we have also uh, mentioned discussed how as we generate more of these concepts describing types and levels of relations, we are going to want to make them as consistent as possible with each other for very valid intellectual reasons. When I say uh, consistency, I mean we must generate uh, typologies of possible variations and interrelations of particular types of relations. Okay. These accounts which, which derive all of social reality from the, from the uh, operation and permutation of a limited number of basic concepts. Okay. Then we have discussed philosophical idealism, I mean a theory which treats the social world as generated from ideas and in this case from a single idea. I mean the structure of our account of society is likely to be very similar whatever idea we start from in some ways. Althusser's account not of actual modes of production, but of the idea of modes of production and Levi Strauss's account of culture oriented around difference or distinction produce quite similar ways of thinking. That is how now we, we have discussed how Levi Strauss performs two operations in his account of human culture, I mean by deploying uh, linguistic analogy to to treat culture not as a system of relations, but as a system of symbolic relations such as myths and using the same linguistic analogy Levi Strauss aims at a purely formal, formal description of the various elements involved in particular myths. In other words Levi Strauss sets out to describe structure, but not the content. Okay? I mean what this leads to is an argument that there is an objective meaning in human culture revealed by structure which is other than the subjective meaning revealed by content. Okay. The, now, we, we, we make a transition from a description of social relations to, to a description of the, uh, of, of the nature of human psyche. What, what Levi Strauss claims to be the central feature of the human unconscious, a claim which he believes to be backed up by linguists, linguistics is naturally enough identical with the concept he uses to analyze the objective meaning of the form of myths. This concept is that of difference or uh, distinction. Okay. 
this is very important. Then in functionalism, we have discussed how, how the complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor and so on. Okay. Uh, and, and then we have, we have uh, discussed uh, what are functional explanations, I mean teleological explanations okay. uh, and, and how, how structuralist interpretation of modernity does not treat the specific elements of modernity uh, though it is a modern one. In, in that is what we have also discussed in the while dwelling upon modernity. Okay. I mean uh, how does radical relationalism lead to structuralism as a holistic account of society and also indicate the well known difficulty that structuralism has with explaining change. Okay. Okay. Uh, then we have discussed uh, how to an extent it seems that uh, Levi Strauss uh, treats the modern as an aberration and unnatural separation of culture and nature and doomed to destruction for that reason. Althusser by contrast fits modernity into a static typology in which uh, it is effectively seems one variant on a pattern. Okay. Uh, that is why I used the term vulgar uh, 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 Marxism in this sense. Okay. Uh, uh, and we have also discussed how Althusser's model of the social reality is that of a decentered whole. I mean all economic, political and ideological things are more important. Okay. Uh, but, but, but the economic is the determinant in the last instance, in other words it has the final say, since the last instance never comes, though it is the interaction which is most important, incidentally this, this tension between determinants, uh, determination in the last instance and the insistence that the last instance never comes is one of the major theoretical problems of Althusser's holism or totality. Okay. Then we have discussed social movements. Um, and within social movements, we have discussed ideology and function and, uh, and within ideology and function, we have discussed the differences between workers movements and new social movements. And then uh, we have discussed the, two, the, the emergence of two Marxisms. Okay. And in, in the case of rationality, we have discussed the meaning of science uh, okay. uh, and, and uh, is particularly Althusser's account of account of um, um, a modernist control of science. I mean science always mediates between the objects of the uh, um, I mean uh, the way Althusser suggested that uh, no, uh, no science always uh, um, mediates between the thought objects and, 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 the, ro ro and the world of reality. Okay. And then uh, in, in reflexivity we have discussed Levi Strauss's uncertainty principle. Okay. Uh, I mean how Levi Strauss uh, argues for a close uh, analogy between culture and language. Okay. Uh, it is very important. I mean one element of uh, uh, Levi Strauss's uh, linguistic analogy is the argument that we can distinguish between the form and the content of a culture or of a language. Okay. Uh, that uncertainty principle um, we have discussed. And in, I mean, we, we end with with the uh, uh, and we end this module of uh, the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist par paradigm in sociology with this lecture. Uh, uh, in the next lecture, we are going to um, discuss the Western Marxist perspectives on 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 critical modernist paradigm in sociology. What I say society as a human creation uh, um, within that we are going to discuss uh, uh, we are going to examine uh, the contributions of western marxists especially the works of um, uh, lukacs gramsci and uh, turin through the lenses of those four critical i mean central philosophical uh, and political foundations of modernity namely uh, holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Okay. Thank you.